I always enjoy Bob's talks. And now, a bit of something different. The whole plan of this two-day conference is to go from the big scale into more detail, and we now make a something of a downshift and move to Neil Stevenson, very well-known novelist and thinker about both the past and the future, uh, because he's put together a team to look at a truly striking big project we might be able to undertake. And so Neil is going to introduce his team, and then they're all going to talk about aspects of the 20-kilometer high tower. Thanks. Greg and I agreed that it might be interesting to have a more nuts and bolts style uh, presentation in the middle of this. Uh, as befits a presentation whose topic is a uh, at the near term end of the spectrum of ideas that we're going to be talking about at this conference. Um, so, um, so I'm going to. Uh, uh, we're, why don't you guys come on up and have a, a, a seat? We're going to be talking about some work we've been doing on. Uh, a yeah, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to take the wireless mic and I'm going to act as Ed Sullivan here for uh, for my my colleagues who've been uh, working on this with me. Um, a little bit of background on this. Um, about 10 years ago, I became aware of some uh, papers uh, written by Jeff Landis, uh, one of which is a solo effort, the other is uh, written with a, a collaborator named Vincent Dennis, um, that uh, were on the subject of uh, constructing a, uh, a tower out of some relatively mundane material such as uh, steel um, to a height of 15 or 20 kilometers and then using it as a base for launching rockets. <clears throat> I'm going to move away and see if the, the wireless mic works. Is it not? Okay. Just put the volume down. So, um, and at first, uh, I didn't find it. Uh, uh oh, there's three buttons. <laughs> I'll, I'll push the, the one in the middle. Yeah. Okay, well, now I see an LED. So, can, can you hear me now? Okay, how's that? Okay, I'll clip, I'll clip it to my beard. <laughs> so the, uh, how's this? Okay, forget it. I'll just uh, stand here. So the, um, uh, at first I, I didn't quite get the, the point of it because um, my sort of undergraduate level uh, understanding of the physics of space launch told me that the name of the game is achieving tangential velocity uh, and that uh, merely gaining altitude is a pretty small part of the overall energy budget. So, um, uh, but the uh, Jeff's uh, papers in include some, some sort of non-obvious arguments about why it would be advantageous to launch fairly conventional rockets from a high platform. And I won't try to go into those in detail um, because I want to move this along, um, but uh, the gist of it is that uh, launching from a high altitude confers a number of small advantages that uh, numerically don't look that impressive on paper, but when you add them all together and take into account the exponential nature of, of rocket engines and, and space launch, they actually can add up to a pretty significant increase in uh, the payload you can get to LEO with a given uh, package of, of hardware. So that idea stuck with me um, because uh, I've spent a lot of time looking at alternative space launch technologies, and a lot of them are, are pretty far out. They're, they're cool ideas, but, but uh, they uh, rely on uh, access to materials or technologies that we don't have yet, or uh, I guess another way of, of putting it is that it's really hard to explain them to senators. <laughs> so whereas a tall tower is a thing that is... Uh, is immediate, it's inspiring, it's interesting, people get it. Uh, and, and another interesting uh, move that, that Jeff made in, in these papers was to stipulate the use of steel, which is a conventional material. Uh, so it didn't rely on, on developing new materials science that we don't have now. Um, so uh, 
fast forward to February 2011, where I found myself participating in a conference called Future Tense at Google headquarters in Washington, D.C., co-sponsored by Slate Magazine and the New America Foundation. And I was on a stage with Michael Crow, the president of Arizona State University. And we got into, never mind what the stated topic of the panel was, uh, we got into a conversation about the relevance of science fiction uh, to innovation. And um, an idea that kind of emerged from that, this is sort of the ideas have consequences uh, notion, uh, is that um, in, in some circumstances, a science fiction story can sort of have the effect of uh, the magnet hidden underneath the card that causes all the iron filings to line up. Uh, these things can uh, inform the activities of large groups of engineers and get them working more efficiently without the need for a lot of internal communication and decision making because everybody understands what the objective is. Um, and uh, to that point, uh, we also talked about how sort of more recent trends in the style and the, the, the tone of science fiction might have interacted with uh, innovation or, or more specifically a failure to, to innovate that I thought I was seeing in our, our civilization during the last uh, few decades. And uh, I should say it feels funny to be talking this way here of all places on earth because the, the school of science fiction writers, if I may call it that, that came out of UCSD never went down this path. So uh, here one tends to see a uh, a more optimistic and positive uh, and achievable tone in science fiction compared to uh, what I have made my career writing uh, and, and, and what has been popular for a lot of the time that I've been an active writer. So um, the trend towards more dystopian, gloomy styles of science fiction uh, I think would have just been a sort of passing literary uh, trend um, were it not for the fact that it seems to be catnip to movie directors. <laughs> and so uh, you cannot have a conversation now in, in Hollywood with movie people without some reference being worked into Blade Runner. They cannot get beyond Blade Runner. Everybody wants to get out the fire hoses and, and make the streets wet and, and make it as Blade Runner-esque as possible. So uh, out of this conversation emerged uh, a, a sort of two-headed beast uh, that is sp specifically intended to address the situation I'm talking about. And one head of it is a science fiction anthology called Hieroglyph, the purpose of which is to create sort of uh, iconic science fiction stories in a more techno-optimistic uh, vein. Not naive, we don't want to go back to, uh, to the, the golden age in, in all of its, uh, in all of its uh, stylistic uh, t uh, ticks, but but we uh, we we do want to to write stories that are about uh, technological innovations, uh, such that uh, people who are just starting their careers as scientists or engineers today could have some realistic hope of achieving these innovations during their working lifetimes, and so that tends to mean that we don't go for new physics uh, or for uh, uh, advances in materials, uh, science, or what have you uh, that, uh, that we don't know how to do yet. Um, so the other head of this, uh, this two-headed beast is the Center for Science in the Imagination at Arizona State, uh, which is a newly created center uh, that is working in, uh, in collaboration with uh, hieroglyph writers on some of these stories. Uh, its director, Ed Finn, is here somewhere. He's tall. There he is. Um, you, you missed it. Uh, he's, he's tall and shy. But uh, the, so so it, it, the the CSI is is remarkably similar uh, in its aims and its uh, philosophy towards the to the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, which is our host here. And so this is kind of a natural collaboration. Uh, anyway. Um, when this all came into being, there was no doubt in my mind what the topic of my hieroglyph story was going to be. It was going to be the tall tower. And so I started out by um, uh, creating a Mathematica notebook and trying to uh, get my head around some of the numbers involved and, and duplicated uh, the, the calculations that Jeff had made in his papers. Um, the, 
the, the basic calculation is a material strength calculation. This is the society for putting things on top of other things. If you take a piece of steel and put more steel on top of it and continue, how high can you go before the, the weight of all the steel uh, exceeds the structural strength of the steel at the bottom of the stack? Uh, and it turns out that if you do that calculation for relatively low strength types of steel, it's a pretty depressing number. But if you use uh, high strength alloys of steel, you can get to heights of 15, 20 kilometers, something like that, before the, the weight of the steel becomes a serious issue. Um, so, um, so having done that, um, the, the next uh, problem that has to be solved is how are you going to distribute that steel across space to make a stable tower that won't, won't buckle and that will stand up? And at that point, um, uh, beyond some hand-wavy stuff about building sort of fractal trusses, I didn't really have anything to contribute. Uh, so I started browsing the Arizona State faculty website trying to see if there might be somebody there who uh, might be able to help me out with some of those calculations. And um, sure enough, uh, found uh, Dr. Keith Jumstad, structural engineering professor at Arizona State, who uh, is, uh, knows a lot about uh, steel knows a lot about computational modeling of large structures, and has a, a strong side interest in rockets and space launch. So I got in touch with him in November of uh, 2011 and explained this to him with a certain amount of trepidation, but he very quickly got interested in it and began, uh, began working the, the problem. So. Uh, Keith is going to come up and talk for a few minutes uh, about uh, about his work on the, the, the project. So there I was minding my own business uh, when I got an email from Neil forwarded uh, by ASU President uh, Michael Crow. And Neil, as he said, was interested in the prospect of launching rockets off of towers 15 to 20 kilometers high. And he sent me the Landis papers, his Mathematica model, and a model of wind load variation that he'd scraped up from somewhere. Do we even know where that is? I'm not really sure. Well, I, I have to uh, confess that I'm not really a structural engineer. I'm a professor of structural engineering. And that makes me just a bit more curious and just a bit less practical than an ordinary structural engineer. So I took the bait. I think the thing that I can add to the conversation today is the thought process that I went through to try to convince myself that the tower was possible and what I did to try to get a preliminary feasible design penciled out. Um, well, the first thing I did was convert the height of the tower to English units. Uh, that's because I'm an engineer, not because I'm English. Uh, 15 kilometers is around nine miles. Dang, that's pretty high. The next thing I did was look up the world's tallest building to see how tall it was. The Burj Khalifa is uh, 0.8 kilometers high, so a 15 kilometer tower would be about 20 times higher than the tallest building ever built. Dang again, that's a pretty big jump. I've been a, in structural engineering for over 30 years, and I've had an interest in tall buildings, but I have to say that I had not really given much thought to the question, how high can we really go until the tower? I knew we could do 0.8 kilometers, and common sense suggested that we could probably go a little higher than that. We'd not yet hit any real kind of limit. I later did this chart of the history of the world's tallest building, you can see that it looks like we hit some sort of limit in about 1930. I have heard various comments on that limit, including one that says at some point the whole floor plan gets taken up with elevators. You can see the extrapolation I did there with the blue line. I put a diamond in there for Frank Lloyd Wright's mile-high building that he suggested in the 1950s. The tower is the dot in the upper right corner. And it's amazing how a logarithmic scale can make you think that something might just be the next evolution. And by the way, those little black things at the base of the tower are the tallest buildings in the world today. The thought bubble sums up my first impressions of the tower, and that would be yikes. 
In retrospect, I think it was really good that the proposed tower was an order of magnitude taller than anything that had ever been built by humans because it took me out of the engineer's plan A, which is to do some sort of increment on what already exists. That is not possible here. There is nothing in any building code or specification that comes anywhere close to being helpful in the design of this structure. One of the things about this project that really got me interested was the imperative of designing from first principles like in the good old days before lawyers started to control most of the conversation about building things. I took a little time to get acquainted with the environment the tower would have to endure, and please keep in mind that monumental structures need to survive for hundreds of years, and it's a little hard to predict what might happen. Suffice it to say that the design environment is highly uncertain. The environment has a few interesting features. First, the air temperature decreases with elevation. A fair amount of the tower exists in really cold temperatures. Building materials do some bad stuff uh, at low temperatures, so we have to come to terms with that. And those are not exactly good working conditions for the builders, so I think we might need robots. The air density drops off up there too. At 15 kilometers, the air density is about one-fifth what it is at the surface, so you would have a hard time breathing at the top without some help. I wanted to take Neil's wind velocity model and estimate wind loads on the tower. This is the model we've been using. The main feature is a peak in wind velocity in the jet stream. We were initially using a peak velocity of about 300 miles per hour, but we more recently revised that up to 460 miles per hour on the advice of someone more knowledgeable of the jet, jet stream. Most models of aerodynamic drag have the force proportional to the square of the velocity, so the jet stream presents a pretty difficult problem. The jet stream hits the tower in a pretty bad spot, and that is key, a key part to the design problem. It's interesting that the wind force drops off above the jet stream, and that means going from 15 kilometers to 20 kilometers is not as big a jump as it first might appear. Put in the simplest possible terms, the design problem really amounts to this. We need to design a structure to carry a payload at the top, think Cape Canaveral, its own weight and the forces that the wind creates. The stress in the material cannot exceed the strength of the material, with a factor of safety, of course. The drift of the structure should be limited to some tolerable level and, of course, the structure must remain stable. The first thing I wanted to do was prove feasibility of the tower. With the stability issue, I was actually not sure it was even possible. So I built a simple analytical model, and that was basically a flagpole, a pretty big flagpole. Even in this simple design environment, the essence of the real problem was pretty clear. The payload creates a need for resisting area at the top. The area of material required to resist that load has weight, and that weight adds to the load. The area that resists the vertical load must be realized through pieces that do not buckle. That limit sets the effective radius of the members. The radius of the members establishes the area that projects into the wind and therefore creates the wind load. The stresses caused by the wind load add to the stresses due to the vertical weight and increases the required area. Global buckling of the structure is a system effect, so you can't just design the tower from the top down. I reasoned that the tower had to have a circular plan because we don't actually know what direction the wind would blow. And even if you could establish a prevailing direction, who knows if that will still be true 100 years from now. It was pretty obvious that the tower would need to taper to reduce the weight and the wind area in the jet stream. It was also pretty obvious that the structure had to be realized through what Neil was calling a fractal geometry. Obviously, this is not a new idea. The reason it is essential, though, is due to the conflict that arises from trying to get material far enough from the axis of the structure to provide stability while limiting the amount of material. If you were to try to do that with a tube, for example, the tube walls would be so thin that it would develop local buckling problems that would limit its ability to carry the loads. This is really the crux of the matter with building high. You need, to, you need girth for stability, but you need to keep the amount of material small. Uh, Mount Everest is a counterexample. 
the problem really boils down to how to keep the structural system working together to accomplish the goal of elevating space. With the simple model, I managed to convince myself that the tower was possible, but the simple model required many assumptions that begged for further study. For example, it is evident that the fractal structure requires bracing members. Those members are not oriented vertically and hence represent material that is not invested in the primary task. Those members do add weight, though. The bracing structure also adds wind area. For a while, I tricked myself into thinking that the fractal construction was a way to control the wind load. As you increase the number of levels of fractalization, the effective radius of the members decreased. There was a happy time in my life not that long ago, when it seemed like the wind could just blow right through the tower without creating much lateral force. I imagined it sort of like being down at the level of atoms where most of the space is empty. I later realized that there's a limit to the fractal idea because you eventually reach the point where the material cannot be packed any closer together, i.e. it is a solid cylinder. That was the day the tower gained a lot of weight. The bottom line is that you pay a fairly high premium in the wind area with fractal construction. However, it's also evident that it should be possible to sheathe the members so that the finer levels of fractalization, which really cannot be avoided, do not enter the wind load considerations. The next step in the design process was the creation of a reticulated model of the structure. This level of modeling made it possible to directly implement some features which had been treated by assumptions and approximations. It also required the spe specification of a geometric description beyond just a tapered vertical column. I kept the radial symmetry in the case that an ill wind might blow. Uh, to hold the structure together, I conceptualized it as a series of rings of different radii which tied the vertical members together. I did not know how many verticals would be needed. It has to be at least three. The Eiffel Tower has four. We might be moving on to five or more. It also seemed evident that the tower would need some sort of thickness to avoid local buckling of the walls, and I provided for that by having inner and outer columns tied together with the rings. The spacing of the rings varied in accord with the radius of the, the tower in an effort to lower the wind load in the jet stream. The geometry was created in modules, each having 14 typical elements that were replicated around the, the ring at each, and at each level. The properties of each element in the module were forced to be the same at each level of the tower to enforce radial symmetry. They could vary from level to level, so a 20-level tower would have 280 design variables, even with fixed geometry. The wind load could be treated more explicitly on a member-by-member -member basis. The wind velocities were still the, the simple model we had started with, but the reticulated model allowed us to count, account for the orientation of the members relative to the wind direction and the bracing members. I also realized that both sides of the tower were facing the wind. The wind blows on the members going in, and it blows on the members going back out. I used the simpler model to guide as a guide to establish the member areas and tower radius, but I soon realized that these were pretty approximate. I also had no guidance from the simpler model on how big to make the bracing members. So I needed an optimizer that could take an initial design and adjust the placement of material to meet the objectives. I selected the simplest possible method. If a member was overstressed, I increased its area in proportion to the square root of the stress ratio. And if it was understressed, then I decreased it in the same manner. Each design iteration requires a full nonlinear analysis of the structure to capture the potential stability issues. So now we have a pretty good idea of what matters in the design of the tower. I can get a 15 kilometer tower to pencil out with 120 KSI steel using an allowable stress of 0.7 or allowable stress factor of 0.7 under a 460 mile per hour peak wind. The tower has 10 main columns with an inner base radius of 6,000 feet and an outer base radius of nearly 10,000 feet. The base of the tower covers about 11 square miles and the largest column requires about 10,000 square feet of material in the cross section. In the picture on the right, the green stress ratios represent nearly optimal use of material. Blue is underused, and that's because it's on the other side of the wind. The total weight 
of the material is 430 million tons, a significant fraction of the total annual world production of steel. Well, that's another yikes right there. But we're, get, we're getting used to it. It's pretty evident that a signif significant challenges remain. For one, the outer cord members of the ring at the lowest level exceed the current longest bridge in the world. We still need to take a look at that. There's no question that the feasibility of the tower rides on our ability to manage the wind load. The areas we can work include reduction of the drag coefficient, management of the wind area through adjustment of the tower geometry, and possibly through use of the wind itself to generate uplift at the moment when uplift is most needed. We also need to better uh, understand the wind environment. The tower does seem to be possible, but there it sits on the outskirts of feasibility in need of some innovation and a little sharper pencil. The frustrating thing about designing the tower is that every time I figured out something important, the tower gained a lot of weight. And I live in fear that we are just one more good idea away from impossibility. And that's all I have to say about that. So the, uh, uh, the, the next step, uh, which started, uh, I guess, earlier this year, uh, is, is a, a, a project to build a, uh, uh, a model of the, a sort of public-facing model of the tower. And this is, again, the brainchild of, of Michael Crow, who, who wanted, uh, had a vision of a, uh, a site that members of the general public could go to uh, and see and manipulate a model of the tower that was structurally sound. So you could, you could drag and drop elements uh, if you wanted to put wind turbines at a certain height or a rotating casino at the top or a city at the bottom or any other uh, things that you think should go on to a tower to help monetize it. Um, that you would have the ability to do that and that the, the, the model would recalculate and tell you how much it was going to weigh and whether it was physically possible to build it uh, and it would look good. Um, and so, um, uh, so that was, that was uh, so the, the, the first uh, objective of this, this project and the second one was to go a little deeper into the aerodynamic aspect of it which as as we've been talking about, it really dominates all other considerations. So uh, we put together uh, a little contract with um, the Furlong Fortnite Bureau, which is a, a group of, of hackers and makers and geeks and engineers that I'm associated with in Seattle, whose purpose is to facilitate forming temporary ad hoc coalitions of people to work on projects for a little while and then disperse. Uh, and so uh, the, there are three members of that group uh, who've been working on this, uh, two of them on the modeling side and one on the aerodynamics. So the two who've been working on the modeling are Daniel McDonald and Jenny Hu, and they are going to come up and talk a little bit about the progress of the, the model. I'm going to talk a little about some of the software tools that we've been using to look at the tower and um, do a few different things. Um, we want to look at the both the structural analysis, so will the tower stand up, will it fall down, what happens to it if you want to add that casino on top when you start launching jets, and we want to be able to visualize this, um, both for our own sakes, which is helpful in the design process, and also for the public. So people interacting with this can really say, yeah, 20 kilometers is tall. Oh, I, I didn't realize that it's actually five times the height of the nearest mountain, that it's the base of this is going to cover Flagstaff. Um, and so visualization tools are really helpful in answering that kind of question. And so we tried to take some of these tools and also bring it together with an interface that can allow the public to easily come up to this say, what happens if I want a 10 kilometer tower, tall tower? What happens if I increase the base to 20 square miles instead of 11? And be able to visualize in real time what that means for the weight, what that means for um, the structural integrity of the tower, and how many years of steel production we start talking about at that point. Um, so 
one of the tools that we started looking at um, is something called DesignScript, which is actually a programming language that can create 3D models. And so we took some of the MATLAB code that Keith had written and brought it into this program, which generates um, a 3D model in a program called AutoCAD. And this is interesting because this language is really designed to allow people to interact with it really easily and to allow people that aren't engineers to change a parameter here, um, just change a couple parameters in the script, and it'll propagate down to the model and be able to double the size, double the width, and you'll be able to see those very quickly. And once it's in this program, you can export that to a 3D model um, with any CAD program, such as SolidWorks or Inventor. And from there, you can start adding elements such as these jet engines or those casinos and adding weight, um, changing the structure size um, of your beams and look at what the implications of that are. So another program that we use to do some of that structural analysis um, is called Robot. And so this is a program that's designed for architects and building engineers to look at um, skyscrapers and put together a frame of steel trusses and building floors and look at which of those elements are going to hold up, which of them might need reinforcing. And this is one of the early examples we did where our members are not quite big enough and were collapsing. Uh, but this is kind of the steps that we might go through to look at each element of this tower as we're putting it together and figure out, is this the right column to use? Is this the right shape? Or do we need to go bigger? Do we need to go smaller? And so um, DesignScript actually has an interface to this program. And we were trying to create really simple tool chains that might allow a user to start with the parameters, um, height, width, number of tile, uh, levels, and get to a place where you can say, this will stand up or it won't. And in this case, you can see the, the top ring is the original shape. The bottom ring is the deformed shape just under its own weight. You can see that it's sinking a little bit. And this is not a particularly bad case. Um, I think Daniel has a couple examples of other ones where the tower doesn't stand up quite as well. Um, I think the red lines at the bottom there are the deflections of the lower members. But after looking at a lot of these um, commercial tools out there, what we realized is that what we really want to focus on is making this something that people can interact with and not just um, fairly complicated programs that you need structural engineers to look at. And so what Daniel's been working on is tying this into a game engine, um, focusing on what the user might interact with and making it really simple to see, making it pretty. And so we wanted a little more flexibility. We didn't need all this complexity. Um, so Daniel has tried to make this something that we could put a web interface on so we can put this online and any user can walk up to it and help this stretch their imagination as far as what can be built. Yeah, so uh, as Jenny said, this is sort of an outgrowth of uh, Michael Crow's original vision that there be some, some public-facing elements here and, and really is a tool to inspire people and get this design problem and think about designing um, these sort of structures that go way beyond what we, we currently think of and using tools that are really algorithmic in nature and not just sort of manually putting members down, really thinking about the, the fundamental aspects of the design. Um, and so, you know, we, we explored a path using tools such as uh, Autodesk and Robot, and, and we eventually reached a, a limit where that wasn't working out. So we went back to basics and um, basically ended up building a, a lightweight front end to um, Keith's original MATLAB script. And so um, what, what we've done is uh, basically create a scene in Unity that talks to MATLAB, and I'll just play it for you. Um, and the idea here is to sort of put this abstract 20 kilometer steel giant thing into context. So here you see a view to the, um, you know, this is near Flagstaff, Arizona, and there's the tower. Um, this little thing here is a nice, conveniently flat and open housing development that I noticed a little, a little ways from Flagstaff. This is about 7,000 feet elevation here, and this mountain that you can sort of see this little bump over here. This is the highest peak in Arizona at about 12,000 feet. Um, so the other nice thing about this visualization is that it helps you 
get a sense of what it's like to have these very tall, thin steel members. And these members are actually not even fractalized yet. These are just sort of, you know, the total area needed for each member to support its weight and then use that to create the radius um, of the cylinder that you're seeing. And you can see even on this screen that it's actually pretty hard to see the top of this thing against a, a, any kind of background. Um, so this tool has some, some limited capability to interface with MATLAB. And one of the things that we can do with it already is um, ask MATLAB to do some calculations. So this is set by some initial parameters here. Um, basically anything in his script can be exposed. Um, ask MATLAB to do some work. And the, so you see Keith's little optimization script running here. You see the weight decreasing. Um, you see the, uh, this is the total weight over here. Um, this is the wind force, and there's some other statistics on that, and that'll take a second to run, and then we'll pull the results into our script, into our front end. And the tower uh, gradually takes on those dimensions, so you can see it deflected, and then a, you know, the radii were updated, so it got even more sparse at the top and uh, you can sort of fly through it and see and visualize where those overstressed members are. So that's sort of what we've done with this. And I think uh, it's Kevin's turn to talk about the aerodynamics of the situation. So our last presenter is Kevin Finke. He's an aerodynamicist. I first met him uh, when he uh, took me for a, a little ride in his glider. He's a, a sailplane enthusiast. Um, and um, uh, he has been working on the, what we've already kind of told you are the most troublesome aspects of the tower, which are the, the aerodynamic aspect. Uh, at a minimum, we need to reduce drag. It might also be nice to be able to uh, produce lift and we've also discussed the idea of adding thrust, of maybe even putting in jet or even rocket engines to push back against the jet stream at those rare moments when the tower is taking a direct hit. So Kevin's going to talk a little bit about some of the work he's been doing in that area. I think the last time I was in an auditorium like this, a professor stood up here and said, for these kinds of problems, we can ignore the mass of the members and we can ignore drag. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk about how to deal with wind forces. Um, as we alluded to earlier, they're quite significant. Uh, one thing that's been interesting about this problem is that a lot of the commercial off-the-shelf tools aren't really capable of it. So we kind of have to go back to your first principles of engineering. And the first principle for me is drag. And it's this fairly simple equation, not very complicated. One half rho v squared, which is a function of the, the fluid you're looking at, the density of the fluid, the velocity. There's some reference cross-sectional area, and then there's a drag coefficient. So the first half, the one half rho v squared, is very much dependent on the fluid you're in. In this case, I'm usually an airplane designer, and I can kind of control the altitude, the density, the velocity. In this case, I'm stuck on the ground. So I'm kind of stuck with the properties of the wind that I have to deal with. The last two parts, area and uh, coefficient of drag, are you know, something that you can use as a designer to control it. So let's take a look at a little bit of these. As, as Keith had said, density of the air falls off with altitude. Um, it's half the value at 20,000 feet, a third at 33,000, and a tenth at 59,000. So that's helping us as a design. You know, we don't have to work against uh, density so much. However, velocity is a problem. And it has this nasty little exponent. Thankfully, it's only a 2, which means <clears throat> as we double our velocity, we f go up by a factor of 4. Um, nominally, jet stream winds are 80 to 120 miles per hour day to day. You're going to see that all the time. Occasionally, you'll get to 200. That'll happen quite often during the year. Um, worst case, it's going to be greater than 300, and then that once in a million storm case, it's, it's well over 400. So those are very big numbers to, to use. 
area, cross-sectional area. Thankfully, we're using a, a, a truss tower, so that helps in getting rid of the area. Um, we're not presenting as much area to it. And then we've got drag coefficient, which is very much dependent on the shapes we use. The problem with drag coefficient is I'm going to imagine a wind direction. In this case, it's always from that side of the screen. As an aircraft designer, I can always do that because I usually fly in one direction. So best drag coefficient would be a nice, beautiful airfoil shape, something that separates the air smoothly, it's long, it's slender, gives you a very low drag coefficient. Unfortunately, wind comes from all the directions. So I have to use a shape that accommodates all directions. Well, we get a very nice, beautiful shape, a circle. <coughs> However, circles are not very good for drag. In fact, that circle and that airfoil at the same width that you see on the screen, the circle is 10 times worse in drag. So it's not a very efficient structure for drag. And, well, I'm not going to say that. So what can we do to counteract drag forces? We can't really do anything with the wind. We can't control the wind, so we're at the liberty of the wind. But we can add external forces to our tower to try and counteract that. So some of the ideas are jet engines, rocket engines, propellers, stuff like that. So I took a look at, well, what about jet engines? GE90-115B is currently the largest turbofan engine in production today. 115,000 pounds of thrust. We use two of these on a 777 engine. It flies an aircraft that's 720,000 pounds at about 550 miles an hour, and it can do it for almost halfway around the globe. <clears throat> it's big, produces a lot of thrust, but we have this little density problem. As I go down, or as I go up in altitude, I lose density, and jet engines scale by the loss in density. So at 20,000 feet, where my ratio is a half, I'm only producing 66,000 pounds of thrust. As I go up to the very top of the tower, I'm down to about 11,000 pounds of thrust. So you lose efficiency. So in this scenario for using jet engines, I'm going to assume that we've designed the tower for the nominal winds, 120, 140 miles an hour. And we'll only use this when we hit those worst case conditions to control the load back to those same levels. I need 22,300 jet engines. <clears throat> GE currently makes them about 200 a year. <laughs> They're $17 million a piece, but that depends on how many you buy. So I'm pretty sure <laughs> at this value we could get a good discount. <clears throat> All right, let's use rocket motors. Rocket motors have a number of advantages, the first one being that you don't lose their thrust capability as you go up in altitude. In fact, you get a little bit of a, a, little bit of a benefit. The biggest one so far is the F1 that launched the Saturn V, 1.5 million pounds of thrust. As you can see, um, a bunch of engineers in the standard work outfit standing in front of it. But we've made some improvements since then. Uh, Pratt & Whitney has developed a F1B engine, which is 1.8 million pounds of thrust. And again, same scenario, it's going to take 700. They made 70 of these for the space program. So it's, you know, it's beginning to begin to be in the, you know, it's not too far-fetched. It's not thousands, it's manageable. But the big thing I think that we really have to work on next is, is really trying to figure out shapes that we can use to, to optimize. Um, as you can see, this is a lot, of, a lot of drag, a lot of power, a lot of energy. There's constructive ways that we can actually use this to our advantage. I think those are opportunities for us to go forward. So um, yeah, that's all I have. I'll give it back to Neil. So that's uh, an overview of what we've been doing with the uh, with the tower. Uh, just uh, uh, in 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 closing, uh, this is uh, this is not us sort of crossing the finish line of of tower design. It's more kind of cocking the starting pistol on what we hope will be a a longer running uh, project in which we can address some of the issues that have come to light so far in the in the work that we've been uh, been doing and. I think uh, all five of us would be happy to chat with people 
uh, later on uh, during the, the conference. So thanks for your attention. Thanks. Um, I want to announce that you're all now free to go to lunch. We might do a Q&A after some people have left. Um, but actually, someone asked me, why is this part of a Starship um, meeting at all? It's because it's about big things. It's about trying to think big again. For as Neil said, we tend to have shrunken our horizons along with our telephones. And uh, thinking about big projects, literally, <laughs> this starts from the ground up. You could, uh, you could easily Im imagine that launching from the top of this tower would be a considerable advantage in getting mass into low Earth orbit, for example. But it's thinking about big things that's got to be part of the habit of, of the culture that will build the interplanetary economy. The second half of today is going to focus on that. We're going to have Patty Grace Smith talk to us about her vision of where entrepreneurial space is going. We'll have Jeff Landis talking about nuclear rockets. And we will have Chris Lewicki from uh, Planetary Resources talking about their business plans for our future. But um, if, if and, and then a panel afterward, right. And then a book signing after that. So the fun goes on. Uh, um, all who wish to leave for lunch now, which uh, may do so, we come back here in an hour. Can we leave things here? Uh, you, can you leave things here? It's probably better to take them. Better to take them. Uh, but we can also do a bit of Q&A now for these people. I've got some questions, too. And uh, be back here in an hour. Ian. Just, just a second. Let him hand you a mic. We're going to use a moving mic from now on for the questions, by the way, folks. Does it work? Is this one Hello? on? Yeah, these are on. Okay. Uh, sorry, it's, it's an obvious question, but you, you focused on steel. Yeah. And so, but clearly it will have occurred to you there must be other, other possible materials that you might have used. So could right. you, can you comment on that? Well, the... Uh, uh, We don't have to use steel. Uh, the, uh, we, we did want to use uh, a mundane material. Uh, we didn't want to, uh, something that tends to happen when we propose sort of radical new ideas, new technologies, is that uh, if you get to the part where you say, then we have to develop a new wonder material or what have you, then that gives an excuse for people to say, oh, okay, yeah, you're talking about some crazy far future thing go off and play in your sandbox and come back to us in 50 years when you've solved your, your little material science uh, problem. And so we kind of like the retro sort of, uh, the kind of shovel-ready aspect of, of using steel for this. Um, it may turn out not to be feasible. I mean, it is, it is pretty heavy. Uh, on the other hand, making huge amounts of steel is something that uh, the world economy is pretty, pretty good at. And we, we know a lot about steel and how it works, and uh, that's knowledge that um, can help, help us avoid potentially nasty surprises uh, during the, the building of such a, a structure. Peter Schwartz. Okay. Uh, Neil, you, you're, you know, uh, you're very familiar with the clock of the Long Now project. Yes. Right, so uh, we're building the 250 foot high clock, solving some very big problems of this sort. Yeah. Um, it does seem to be quite plausible that if you put it in that kind of context, I and mean, this is a project that's now been underway for about 15 years, the first version will be up in a few years, the first big version that Bezos is building in Texas. But the scale of problems and the class of problems that you're talking about are the kinds of problems that I think we've been solving, been building the 250 foot high clock yes. in a cavern in uh, Texas. So it doesn't seem at all implausible to me, anyway, that what you're talking about, particularly if you think about then, because we're not building it out of conventional steel, we'll be using relatively exotic materials, everything from ceramics to tungsten and, and, the, the and titanium. Clock, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the clock. So it doesn't seem at all plausible if you particularly allow, uh, 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 implausible if you allow for those kinds of improvements in materials as well. Yeah, yeah no, we're, yeah, I, I don't mean to, to state a doctrinaire position. Uh, about steel, uh, but uh, it's uh, it's a little bit to, to make a point, and and, and the, the the larger point, which uh, which you and, and and Greg have both already alluded to, is that.
this is both a project and a kind of meta project. I mean, we're serious about wanting to build this and learn more about it, but the process of thinking about it helps us kind of limber up muscles that we as a civilization have forgotten how to use. Yeah. Um, Mary and then Jill. Did, did you, um, may I assume that this would need pylons under it and did you do any engineering uh, investigation of what that would involve? You want to talk about what it's on top of? Yes, this tower is going to sink to the center of the earth. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, uh, you know, the, the whole reason it gets so heavy is because you basically put more and more material to spread out the stress. And I think when you, when you hit the ground, uh, we've got a lot of things that weigh that much that are sitting on the face of this earth that aren't, aren't going anywhere. And so I think at some level then it becomes a fairly conventional foundational problem. And the good thing about the foundation is that it's not uh, 20 kilometers up in the air, and so you can a lot of the things you can already do today, you can still do there. But yeah, you you know, you, it's going to have to have a pretty good foundation, down to bedrock, um, piles, things like that. Uh, can you pass the mic to Jill Turner? So let let me follow on to that foundational question. At some point, did you do a trade-off? Um, with the, the idea of building a symmetric structure to building an airfoil and transfer the problem to creating a, a platform that can rotate and that can take the weight. Can you save enough weight from reducing the stresses with an airfoil shape? A single to make that vertical airfoil that would, that would spin around. Right, so yeah. now your problem gets how do you support that weight in something that can rotate, yeah. but is it fundamentally a lot less massive. So we can, uh, <clears throat> the, the sort of two uh, general approaches that we've talked about for that is to sheathe individual members in airfoils that could pivot. And <clears throat> uh, an, another, the, the thing with the holes that maybe Kevin could, could speak to. Well, I was gonna just say uh, the, the, one of the challenges with moving a sail is you need to move it pretty quickly if you have gust responses. And so uh, wings are fantastic at creating enormous amounts of lift, sometimes 50 to 100 times what they create in drag. And so if, if we're struggling with handling wind loads in one direction and then we have suddenly the possibility of creating lift in a perpendicular direction which would run away from that, I think it would be a challenge. But that being said, uh, no, we haven't started doing those kinds of trade studies. Uh, most of the studies that we've been looking at have been in trying to concentrate on reducing the drag of the individual elements. So some things that we're exploring are, are fairings around the structures. Um, uh, we're looking at uh, boundary layer control where we use suction and blowing to control the drag coefficients. Um, so you cover the surface with millions of tiny holes and suck yeah. air in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next, John Kramer. Yeah, I was wondering, you didn't say anything about where you were thinking of putting it, and it seems to me that the location is an interesting variable because you can minimize the effect of the jet stream. For example, if you built it at the South Pole, there would be no jet stream to worry about. But on the other hand, that might comp co uh, compromise the ability to do, do space launches from there. Yeah, yeah we, uh, we actually did put a bit of attention into uh, figuring out what areas uh, have less likelihood of a jet stream hit. and. Um, Equator pretty good. Uh, it, yeah, when you go, so when you go, it, it's it's sort of the the middle latitude, the 40s uh, and and 30s that tend to be pretty bad. Uh, the um, in the continental U.S., it seems like the uh, the Southwest is 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 pretty good. The Central Valley of California, uh, going on into Arizona and so on. Um, so um, so the. What it comes down to, though, is that you still have to plan for uh, that rare worst-case scenario. So um, it's not it's not clear how much benefit you can really reap by going to a low jet stream area. You, you still have to to make it capable of withstanding the rare freak. Uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, there's a question no in back. Infrastructure either. <laughs> uh, I'll take the next question because I've got the mic. Oh, okay. The, uh, uh, what, how about <laughs> Kilimanjaro, near the equator and flat? 
and uh, you want to reduce the, uh, the velocity necessary to get and into orbit. someday, it's at the equator, someday a hook may come down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I see where you're going. Um, yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, <clears throat> the, the, this was a fairly compressed presentation, and so we didn't get into some of the, so, so two, <clears throat> two things we could obviously consider are one, Using the uh, the tower not just as a stationary launch platform, but as a thing to hold up an accelerator, a slingatron pointed up, or a, a, a ramjet in tube accelerator pointed up, something like that, and or connecting it to a, a skyhook coming down from from space. So th those are all completely on the table and very much on our minds, and we just haven't uh, tried to go there yet, um, and, and we certainly didn't have time in this this talk. Maybe one more yeah. question way in the back. <coughs> Just, yeah. Um, the question I have is, is the planet talking about power? Yeah. Rather than being able to jump you know, 40 kilometers in a circle, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, my my initial thought is is that um, we tend to worry most about weight, and so we want to see everything pointed vertically. But what we've learned in the course of doing this is that the big stresses aren't so much weight as the lateral stresses produced by, by wind. So for all I know, uh, going to that kind of a more spread out shape might, might be better than a, a, a tower. We just haven't looked at it. And it might catch more wind. We don't know that either. So I mean, it's, it definitely deserves um, investigation. Uh, there's another gentleman right there. Maybe one more question. Uh, hand him the mic. No, he's behind you. He just walked by. Uh, no. Watch. <laughs> he's behind you. Like that. Oh well. Um, shout it out. Yeah, shout it out. You know. <laughs> we'll I hate to lose all this time on the mics. <laughs> Test them. There you go. Uh, the obvious question is, what about a guy wire? You know, they use that on TV towers for this yeah. same reason. You want to guy wire? Have the guy wire conversation? Yeah. So I did. I did the guy wire, and um, the problem with the guy wire at, at at 15 kilometers high is that the angle that it makes with the tower is about 13 degrees, and so its ability to stabilize is wow. pretty limited. And if you do an optimal design of the guy wire, you realize that you've just done the tower upside down, and it's a very, very massive, um, very massive thing, and it's adding a lot of weight, and it's providing fairly small uh, lateral stabilization. Jordan Kerr, who's well known to a lot of people in this community, has talked about a, a different design that he called the, the fairy castle, where you'd have the middles of the guy wires supported by smaller towers, and the guy wires that hold them up supported by smaller towers yet to sort of alleviate that problem. And it's an interesting idea, but we just haven't, uh, that's another one that we haven't really looked at yet. Okay, there's many, 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 many aspects to this problem. So, yeah. be back here at 1.30, we'll start it all over again. Thanks. Okay.